Hey everyone, Doug with BNH here. Apple's new MacBook Pro upgrade is one of the biggest pieces of news for creators, but video editors like yours truly should especially take notice. The move to bigger and better Apple Silicon chips, that being the M1 Pro and M1 Max, combined with a near complete overhaul of the physical design of the machines, makes this release one of the most compelling upgrades in the past few years for video editors partial to the Mac OS ecosystem. We were able to take the 16 inch model for a spin, and this one's maxed out with the M1 Max chip, featuring a 10-core CPU, 32-core GPU, 32 gigabytes of memory, and a one terabyte solid state drive. You can, of course, upgrade this to 64 gigabytes of memory and an eight terabyte SSD. And if that's a little more than you need or simply a bit out of your budget, Apple offers a wide range of options in the lineup. Based solely on spec alone, these would be impressive laptops for video editing, but those M1 chips may be a mystery to those used to Apple's previous offerings, and of course, chips from Intel and AMD. So what are the M1 chips? Well, back in 2020, Apple announced that they were moving away from Intel processors to their own custom designed silicon. Since then, we have seen them gradually add their first generation chip, dubbed the M1, into consumer focused machines like the MacBook Air, Mac Mini, and the iMac. So moving to the professional side a year later, that's where the appropriately named M1 Pro and M1 Max step in. They're based on the same underlying architecture, but use a lot more of it and focus on performance aspects. While the base M1 featured a balance of four efficiency cores and four performance cores, the top end M1 Max that we're gonna show here uses just two efficiency cores alongside eight performance cores, giving you 10 total. Still very efficient, but the balance is more towards the performance. More efficient chips means you can actually squeeze more performance out of them while staying in a cramped laptop chassis running off of an internal battery. Still, this is all very new tech, so it's worth taking a look. According to Apple, compared to the original M1, these new chips allow for the use of up to 13.4 times faster 4K renders in Final Cut Pro, five times faster effect rendering in DaVinci Resolve, and 11.5 times faster object tracking in Final Cut. Those are some serious improvements. In some cases, like with Apple's own Final Cut Pro, the optimizations have been more noticeable as they make the most of all the different cores and integrated hardware encoders and decoders to speed up the app. In other cases, like Adobe After Effects, full Apple Silicon support is still pending and the differences aren't quite as dramatic. For video editors who need to know, right now, Apple Final Cut Pro, DaVinci Resolve, and Adobe Premiere Pro have official native support for the M1 processor. After Effects was announced to be on the way soon, but these things do take time. If the app hasn't yet been updated for native support, Apple's Rosetta 2 can allow you to run them in many cases with no issue, though you won't be seeing the same performance gains. When it comes to power and battery life, Apple shows off some impressive figures for the M1 equipped MacBooks. This is a combination of processor efficiency and bigger batteries. The 14 inch comes with a 70 watt hour battery while the 16 inch has a 100 watt hour battery that hits the FAA limit for safely taking on a plane. While there isn't a clear test of how good these are, Apple states up to 17 hours of video playback for the 14 inch model and 21 hours for the 16 inch. Those are major improvements over the previous models, 10 additional hours for the 16 inch. In use, you can feel that the new MacBooks are lasting far longer than their predecessors. A full day of mixed use work is certainly possible with the new MacBooks, but as you could expect, if you are solely doing intense video editing or similar work, the battery will of course drain faster. Something to keep in mind though, is that these battery life figures are based on the M1 Pro chips, not the supercharged M1 Max. The extra GPU cores and dedicated chip components will drain more of the battery over time, even when you aren't making full use of them. If you're gonna go for the full power M1 Max, you might not see the top of the line battery life there. Still, in our time with a 32 core GPU model, we were able to get enough power for a regular workday jumping between web browsing, text documents, image editing, and some video editing, of course. One other note is the 16 inch will offer a high power mode if you want to ensure maximum performance while you work. If you find yourself plugging into AC power most of the time, this high power mode could save you some time. But let's see exactly how the performance pans out for some video tests. Before we get to that though, let's first look at the display. 
Apple's Liquid Retina XDR technology with ProMotion has made its way to the MacBook Pro. This uses mini LED technology featuring 10,000 small individually controlled LEDs to illuminate the screen. This allows you to view HDR content with a sustained brightness of 1000 nits and a peak brightness of 1600 nits while retaining very deep blacks. Contrast is quite frankly incredible on this display and it continues to feature the wide P3 color gamut. Now, some video editing apps like Final Cut and Resolve actually support HDR viewers on this display. Now, this means that you could theoretically perform and monitor an HDR grade in the app. And while this isn't nearly the same as a $30,000 reference monitor, it is interesting that now your everyday filmmaker could experiment with HDR editing on their laptop. The best part, in my opinion, is how the HDR is handled, though, by macOS. Only the segment of the screen that is HDR is shown in HDR, leaving the rest of the desktop interface in standard SDR. On a related note, the full dynamic range of the screen only does kick in with HDR content. For most normal use, you'll be using the screen in its 500 nit SDR mode, which should be similar to existing MacBooks. ProMotion is a nice upgrade as well, with an ultra smooth refresh rate of up to 120 Hz. It'll also automatically vary the refresh rate based on content to conserve battery, going all the way down to 24 Hz when you have static content on screen. Users can even lock in some frame rates, which could be useful for video editors who want to make sure their video preview doesn't stutter on playback. Now, performance wise, I was incredibly impressed with how easily this M1 Max just chewed through this real world 4K project. This project contains a mix of 4K H.264 10 bit content, 6K ProRes RAW content, color effects, and some motion graphics throughout. Even at 100% playback resolution, it scrubs through almost flawlessly, just a couple of drops here and there. But if you drop down to half res, it's super fast. Moving over to render times, the M1 Max can export HEVC with a hardware encoder, making exports fast and easy. Now, yes, yes, about that notch. It is there, and in many cases, you can see it clearly. A lot of pro apps have a lot of menu options. Plus, if you use your own menu bar tools to monitor computer performance, you might actually run out of room here. If the app is updated, it'll simply jump over the notch. However, there are still some bugs where items get hidden. It's not perfect, and the aesthetic choice is going to annoy some people, but it doesn't come at the expense of actual screen real estate in most cases, as Mac displays do have a 1610 ratio, meaning it won't get in the way of most 16 by nine videos. It's not ideal, but it's also not a deal breaker considering the other benefits here. As a plus though, the notch includes a better 1080p webcam, so you will look better on those video calls. Aside from the exciting M1 tech here, connectivity is probably my favorite upgrade here, and I'm sure it's going to be the same case for many other users as well. Apple had been pushing aggressively into a unified setup with just Thunderbolt slash USB-C ports, which unfortunately brought us all into a world filled with dongles. Understandably, many people weren't so happy about this, especially on the Pro line. But Apple listened here as the 14-inch and 16-inch MacBook Pros offer three Thunderbolt 4 slash USB-C ports, an HDMI 2.0 port, and a UHS-2 SD card reader. The headphone jack even got an upgrade to support high impedance headphones. Using this combination of ports, you can actually plug in two Pro XDRs with the M1 Pro chip or up to three Pro Display XDRs plus a 4K TV with the M1 Max. You can once again just plug everything right into your computer. Perhaps the best return here, though, is the MagSafe port. MagSafe was a beloved charging port for Apple laptops, and it was safer as it would just disconnect if you happened to trip over the cable while the computer was plugged in. Now, this new version, dubbed MagSafe 3, of course, is stronger and faster. Users can now fast charge the MacBook to 50% power in just 30 minutes using the MagSafe charger. Don't worry though, if you are partial to your own USB-C chargers, you can still charge using any of the USB-C ports, though you do lose the fast charging benefit. For wireless, Apple has moved to Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.0. Now, one of the most visible changes to the MacBook Pro is that it is bigger. They are noticeably thicker than the last gen MacBook Pros, and there's a little bit more weight to it too. Apple seems content to let the Pro models breathe a little better, and the upgrade and cooling design inside supports this. I'm all for it personally. In many cases, the fans on the 16-inch model we're using didn't even audibly kick in until we did some longer renders where the chips were running at max for sustained periods. Another welcome change is the return of a more traditional scissor switch keyboard that feels a lot better to type on. Plus, 
the touch bar has vanished and been replaced with a full height function key row. Very nice. Touch ID is still around though, in the same place. The trackpad remains the same, which has been very good for a long time already. It's nice and large and responsive. No complaints there. It's worth mentioning that Apple upgraded the internal speakers as well, and they actually sound really good for something out of this form factor. The six speaker arrangement promises 80% more bass, you can hear it, and a clearer soundstage. There is also support for new spatial audio formats. If you often use the built-in speakers, you'll definitely enjoy this change. So overall, the new MacBook Pros, dare I say it, feel more pro. That does come with some added heft, but in my opinion, the benefits far, far outweigh the downsides. In use, the new MacBook Pro also feels mature, which does make sense as the M1 platform has had a whole year to develop before being implemented into the Pro line. So for a laptop that draws so little power and can run as long as it does, it is remarkable at times just how well everything runs. That's it for the new 2021 MacBook Pro with the M1 Max chip. I'm Doug with B&H, and I'll see you next time.